Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Garrity with Turnkey Technologies. Uh, welcome to our shootout today. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody in the room as well as all the remote participants today. It's very nice that from a technology standpoint, we can all sit in our pajamas and watch a uh, ERP presentation. So starting off today, again, just quick agenda. Again, we've got some, uh, some snacks in the back. The remote people don't get that, but a quick introduction for me. Um, and then from an agenda standpoint, we're going to be comparing three different solutions today. So you're going to have me up front looking at Dynamics GP. Um, again, I am the owner and the president of the company. Uh, coming up, we're going to take a short break. Again, we'll, we'll be prompt on those. And again, I am going to be very respectful of time today. Second up, uh, Tony Mercurio, my uh, AX practice director, Dynamics 365 Enterprise product. He'll be giving you a, a presentation on that solution, which is the Microsoft Hero product. Um, after that, a little short break again, and then we'll have Bill Drogi coming up and he'll be showing us the 365 Business Edition. So we've got three, three products. Uh, we promise it to be fast and furious and competitive, even though we're all on the same team. Um, we will be selling against each other. At the end, we'll, we'll have a short recap. We'll take some questions, certainly follow-up actions and so forth. So, so goals for the event. Um, again, what is ERP? Uh, most, of, most of the people in the room should understand enterprise resource planning or back office systems. And again, the, the comprehensive nature of these, they include financials, supply chain, manufacturing, project, human capital management, analytics, and sometimes much, much more. Um, again, our goal today is a quick overview of three distinct ERP solutions. Um, again, we're looking at capability, we're looking at industry fit, licensing models, there's more details that will come out during the session today. You know, why would you be here? You know, ideas, you know, again, uh, narrow, narrow candidates down, you know, what would I want to focus on if I'm looking at a replacement solution for something that's currently in the business? Um, I've got about 45 minutes from my slot, I do talk fast, uh, you know, from a standpoint of a couple more high level things as we just think about our positioning, again, I started the company 23 years ago. Um, today is this is a, a little snapshot from one of our pieces of collateral, but if you think about business consulting, consultative approach, again, your trusted advisor and even agnostically looking at, you know, what are the business requirements, how do we make a decision on what solution that you're looking for? You know, we don't come in and say, oh, GP, oh, it's enterprise, oh, it's business, and so as we think about the process today and presentation and preview and what's my impressions of it and does it have the capability, does it have the fit and so forth. Post system selection, you can see that our firm really were an end-to-end -end service provider, um, implementation, systems integration, we customize systems when required, cloud hosting, um, manage IT services, support training, uh, reporting and BI. Um, again, we have that lifelong service ambition in the organization. I've had clients on the books for 20 plus years. Uh, part of that is because of a service philosophy. Um, if you look at our summarized offering, and there's certainly a lot more content on our website, I use the slide for uh, my existing customers just to remind them of what we're doing. But, uh, you know, today we represent the Microsoft Dynamics portfolio stack. And, and uh, the product that's not in there that you guys have is the SL product, but uh, GP, uh, 365 Enterprise Business, certainly the CRM, the front office piece, which is sales service, marketing, field service, Dynamics talent has showed up in there also. If you think about industry partners, there's probably 50, you know, but as we pick line of business applications that, that actually connect to these systems, rental, service, supply chain, corporate performance management, many, many, many more. Um, we are a private cloud hosting partner, so we have a commercial data center in downtown St. Louis. Very specific, we host Dynamics GP. Dynamics GP is a through partner application, um, and we host that specifically. Um, we represent the cloud stack, so if you think about what's that mean, it's Azure, it's Office 365, and everything that's in there, Power BI, SharePoint. Um, that gives us that ability as a partner to really look at the organization holistically from end to end. We may be zeroed in on ERP, but as we take a step back, we want to make sure that everything is working together in your installation. Um, my coming soon, I laugh about that Salesforce uh, Intact. I've actually already signed up with Intact. Next, uh, next time we do this, we'll run four products. We'll have three Dynamics products. We'll have Intact in there, um, a very interesting solution. We also plan on doing a CRM shootout between Dynamics CRM and Salesforce. So interesting stuff. Um, again, we already mentioned professional services. And I will stay on top. So Dynamics GP, um, I have been around this solution for 30-something years. So I've watched it grow up. Um, you know, in the early 80s, I was a, an engineering computer science student that spent about eight years in public accounting. And how did I get into an accounting firm? I helped a company buy Great Plains software from a guy. And this guy, I was such a smart whip, he'd call me and said, never mind. They brought me into the accounting firm. So here's an engineer in the early 80s doing ERP and CRM. So accounting and technology, I married him up 30-something years ago. But as far as GP, and as we talk about this solution, you know, it was privately held in the 70s, the 80s. Microsoft came into play in, uh, in 2001 and bought them. Um, it was the public company by then. 
but the product has been around for 32 years. And so, you know, if you think about the portfolio we're talking about, Dynamics GP is the oldest product, ERP product in Microsoft's Dynamics portfolio. SL's been in there. GP actually bought SL, so when they bought GP, they got SL as well. So that's just a little bit of history, but as you think about 32 years, in two-year revolutions, there's a lot of evolution of this product. So what you see is completeness. You see robustness. Um, 2016 R2 is the current release. They'll have another release that's coming out. About every two years they do that. Um, close to 50,000 companies in the U.S. running this product. It's a very large customer community. There's local user groups. There's national user groups. Again, to that point, there's a very large partner ecosystem. I get hit by a bus. There's lots of people that can support the application. There's also lots of people in industry that have worked with the application. I have a partner that told me there's 17 million people to get paid out of GP payroll. That's amazing, 17 million. So quite an imprint as you think about the industry application there. Uh, again, maturity. Um, key solution details. Um, and again, my goal is this is not a PowerPoint for me today. I've got about three or four slides and we're going to do some live sessions. But if you think about you know, full client, web client, HTML5 experience, cross-platform. So we can run it on iPads, iOSs, Androids. Okay. Choice, lots of choice. Um, full users, limited users, self-service users, so there's tiered. There's client access licensing, we can buy it, we can own it, post it, put it on our systems, we can do subscriptions. So this is one of those products that on-premise is still a very thriving part of the business, but uh, hosting, we, we see about six or seven out of 10 of these things going into the cloud in a complete SaaS model where people are paying per user per month, they don't own anything, no platform, it's managed, all the updates are included. I talk about extensive industry solutions, why is that key? 30-something years, people have plugged the gaps. As we look at line of business and deep industry, there are lots of things out there, and, and that's not a negative thing. It's actually very positive um, because it's, it's, I use the example a lot of times where um, you buy something, you like, you still need to accessorize, and we're, we're plugging in those, those things, just what I need. Role-based user security, um, multiple entities. Um, I can have lots of companies. Uh, Role-based security, it's a pessimistic application. Security is a big concern for everybody these days, and GP goes deep on that. Um, the, roles, the roles influence the user experience. The content disappears. In my installation, it's got everything. I'm an administrator, but for a purchasing user, they could have a button, enter a PO and print a PO, and it certainly simplifies training, doesn't confuse them, keeps them from exploring. Extensible. So core solution, if we needed to do customizations, we can extend it with Dexterity, with Visual Basic, with .NET, with SQL reporting services. Integration. You know, my firm has three gold competencies with Microsoft, ERP, CRM, and application integration. Hub spoke. GP is a great hub in organizations, whether you're running the line of business there or you're using it as a financial hub and we're integrating to line of business systems. Web services, eConnect, SQL Server, integration services, Scribe. Lots of tools out there to create two-directional integrations. It's a very open architecture from that perspective. Come on. So we talk about stack integration, and again, as you hear between the three products today, you're going to see that, okay, we all have stack integration, some more than others, okay? We live in the cloud, we live on-prem, again, that, that hybrid model, but if we think about just stack today, Windows Server 2012-2016, including Active Directory integration, SQL Server 2012-2016, very scalable, I can take SQL Server and I can drive it up into a clustered model. So we think about horsepower. How big can this get? And I can make the same statement for a lot of solutions, but GP, whether in a private hosted or in a non-premise, I can cluster SQL servers and I can get very, very big. Um, I probably have uh, 10 companies over a billion dollars running on GP on my client list alone. I think nationally there's a lot more than that, but all the way down to the small mom and pop shops. We've got two, three million dollar companies running a couple users, but again, we go all the way up to hundreds of users. And so that scalability is, is really empowered based on server configuration. GP doesn't have any inherent limitations on how many transactions. Decimal precision goes out to 999 billion, which is normally adequate for most people. Um, Office 365 integration, mail, of course. There's services built in, email document distribution native in the system. Word integration, Microsoft built in a Word runtime into GP. Why is that important? Because we can generate PDFs without having to go get an Adobe license. That's kind of a neat little feature. So, you know, Google Shops, you know, it'll work with Google if you're, you know, Google Mail if you're using an Outlook client. But there are some limitations of not using a Microsoft Office stack with some of these solutions. Things don't light up the same way in a Google Mail client that they do in an Outlook client. Just be advised. Excel, Excel is a big part of the solution. Microsoft delivers connected, live data connections between Excel and the ERP system. 
What's that mean? It means my user experience doesn't have to be logged in doing transaction entry. I could be sitting in Excel doing pivot tables and so forth. Power BI, hot topic. How do I consume the information in my ERP? You'll find that in every solution that we're looking at today, I can have a Power BI experience, whether I'm consuming it on my mobile device, on my desktop, or embedded right within the application. So again, the full user, he's in the application, Power BI is embedded. I'm a light user. All I'm doing is consuming information, and I can be anywhere consuming through a Power BI. It's the same data set. SharePoint. Different degrees of SharePoint integration. For GP, it's workflow. Okay? I don't have to use SharePoint for workflow, but you know, workflow is baked into GP, where I don't have to stand up a SharePoint platform to do workflow, but certainly it's extensible. It can connect to SharePoint. As we look at the other solutions, you'll see more SharePoint integration. We talk about Dynamics 365, aka Dynamics CRM, sales, service, marketing. Two-way integrations, there's, there's dropping off the shelf integration there that's very robust, extensive. Map point, again, hey, where's my customer? If I'm doing route planning and stuff, those things are being integrated as well. Um, uh, come on, change. How come there's a little delay here, boss? Sorry, my slide's not changing. There we go. So this is a blurry slide, and I'm not going to go through every line item on this. On the memory stick that Brad is delivering you, there is a brochure on there that's the GP 2016 R2. This is a screenshot that comes from there. The reason I throw this up there is you think about all-inclusive. What did Microsoft include in a single license? Starter pack. So all that feature in the orange is all part of the core functionality. A financial stack, very rich. Supply chain stack, human capital management, business intelligence and analytics. It's everything a company needs to really use this thing that's even in the distribution business. Um, but like Microsoft, there's always more, and they have a, an extended additive, and it takes us deep into distribution. It takes us deep and brings us into manufacturing. It takes us into a project subledger. It takes us deeper into field service and depot management. And then certainly there's integration tools and there's human capital management. These are all Microsoft OEM components. And again, as you want to read, the brochure on the memory stick goes deep on what's included in those. Um, industry solution examples, we talk about budgeting and forecasting. We sell a lot of corporate performance management. Cloud-based budgeting, financials, line of business, analytics. It's a different experience. It kind of moves up above the core ERP, but we're addressing larger constituencies. Um, multi-entity management. I mentioned multi-entity. I can have lots of company databases, but we have orgs that, hey, we want to put 50 legal entities into a single model and manage them with security and do intra company balancing so we can get much more sophisticated on the accounting there. Um, credit card processing, payment processing, online bill pay portals, uh, e-com and customer portals. These are plug-in. We don't go out there and have to build integrations. These are just, they're just accessories. EDI, warehouse management, shop floor data collection, shipping systems, job costing, equipment, field service, there's CRM again, collections, commissioning, container planning. I mean, again, how does this happen? We've got a core solution. What are your pain points? What are your line of business requirements? And these things are basically a la carte type accessories. So very large collection. I like to mention those. There we go. That's it for PowerPoint. So, so what I've chose to show you guys today is a few different things. And, uh, you know, normally I start my presentation, so let's talk about the user interface, and let's talk about what things look like. like. And this, let's jerk this thing out of here. This is the full GP client, and so if you think about it, it's a role-based experience, and this is what we call the fat client, okay, which means I can install it on a workstation, I can install it on a terminal server, Citrix server, users log in, connect to this, whether they, whether they feel like they like this, but most people like the rich experience. And from a navigation standpoint, you can see that I have my actionable items up here. And these are. These are live business intelligence links where if this is my workload. I'm in here processing and looking at how customers are dealing with credit limits. And what that does is it drives me down into a tool that's part of the system called a smart list. And so, you know, smart list is not just pretty, but it's actionable. There's lots of go-tos, which means I can drive through these things and get down to the customer master. And so maybe I need to make an action there. But... You know, normally when I'm doing these scenarios, it's like, okay, well, what do I need to look at if this is my workload to decide? Maybe I need to go look at the customer's payment summary, and I can say, okay, he's paying on an average of 30 days. Okay, what else do I need to decide to make a credit decision? You might say, well, he's at 80, 50, all right, well, he's a good customer, and if I want to come in here and say, well, I'm going to update his credit limit, and I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to make it 85,000, and, but I may come in and say, you know, there's a caveat that if he goes over 30 days by as much of a dollar, I want a warning. Okay, maybe, and, and that's one way to say, okay, I'll give him 85, he stays in his terms code. But the, the point of this illustration is I've made an update to a customer, and I come back, and when I refresh, guess what? My workload disappears. So these are, these are prompts, and if you think about, you know, how do we get people actionable and put them on task? 
big emphasis throughout all of our systems is we want people to know what work needs to be done. Actionable business intelligence, okay? So there's one example. You can see other things here. I need to purchasing requisitions. This whole experience is configurable based on the user. So depending on your role, what work do you need to do, how do you do it efficiently, can I drill through? Um, other things about the user experience, I like to just talk about configuration. And if you look at these menus, they're big. There's a lot. We configure, we configure, we configure. This system has inherent workflow. It knows about quote to cash. It knows about procure to pay. We configure it, changes the user experience, changes your role. Things disappear, things behave differently. Um, menus down the side, if you think about the concept of what we call navigation lists, this showed up years ago, um, but it was really the Microsoft Outlook 2007 navigation panes. And if you think about, oh, sales order transactions, and, and this is just a different look, but as we think about navigation and you know, how do I process work and kind of this, and you could recognize, these are the ribbons that showed up in office, but you know, conceptually, what am I doing? Well, when I select an order, I have work that can be done. Again, very configurable, but if you think about business process, Okay, how do, I, how do I manage that process from left to right? And I can change these things. So that my shipping guy, he knows what he's doing. And moreover, you see that there's favorites in here. Okay, well, it's not submitted, what's submitted, but very quickly we can get to workloads and we can filter. So that's one part of the experience. And the other thing is everybody never believes is this is the web client. So this is the exact same thing and I can open it up in an HTML5 browser or use the fat client. And, we configure this for clients with an internet facing deployment. Okay, that's great, which means I can be out there with my tablet and I can be in GP and I can be walking around and, you know, it looks a little different, but the, uh, the evolution of the web client and, you know, the feature functionality and, you know, even drilling into an account window and there's the navigation list you just saw. Okay, so exact same look and feel. Um, these are area pages, you know, if I want to go in and I want to set up a new GL account, you know, my windows look the same and, you know, one of the things that GP's done is they've been very consistent look and feel. You know, everything across the top, red fields are required. I've got hyperlinks, I've got notepad. And again, throughout the system, I have the ability to come in here and attach documents, okay? Um, I can attach just about anything I want, whether it's master files or transactions, everywhere I see that notepad, I can put in multiple documents and they're encapsulated in the database, which means I can access them from anywhere. They're not pointing at little folders that could be disconnected, okay? So web client, nice experience. And again, power of choice. Now, as we think about user licensing, the self-service users, they only get the web client. A full user, you get all the assets in the system. A limited user is read-only. They can use the full client, they use the web client. Self-service users, all they get is a web app. Time and expense, I'm doing requisitions, and I'm employee, I want to go change my W4. Those are all based on a web experience for those users, okay? So again, a little bit on look and feel. So if I kind of step back, and we talk a little bit about analytics, you know, what are the big impactful things? You know, we talk about, where's the wow factor? <clears throat> this is a tool that I like to show. It's called Business Analyzer. And you think about, it's in the App Store, so you can go out there and download this and play around with it. But this connects to our GP installation. And again, desktop, mobile device, but you know, why do I like this? Is because it kind of gives you a feel for the nature of the analytics that can be attached. And you know, if we think about technology behind the scenes, I talked about this smart list builder, which is a bunch of SQL views. Okay, and if we think about this data, there's a full data warehouse that ships with the system too. Cubes, pivot tables, and so forth. But these examples, again, if I'm interactively playing with my data, okay, that's all great. But in Business Analyzer, what else shows up in here? Key performance indicators. And again, you can see that I'm logged in as the CFO. I also get my financial statements right here. So from a consumption standpoint, I don't have to be in the office. I've got my little tablet, I've got my Business Analyzer, and I've got a 360 view of the world through this experience, okay? So financials, and again, what else can I do here? I can say, well, let's go in here and change. Where's my little link here? Come on, let's go bend it right here. Let's go change roles, and maybe now I'm the accounting manager. Different experience, different charts, different graphs. Hey, no financial statements. So um, lots change, multi-entity, I could change between companies. So business is it's just one component in the solution. Um, I mentioned Excel. So one of the things that I'm showing, and this is a list view. This is the smart list. It's the exact same data. It's real time. It's connected. I can interact. I can filter this. I can do lots of different stuff. Maybe I'm looking for line items for a specific, you know, inventory item. I'm outside the system. You know, one of the things I get with this, this experience is the refresh. I don't import and export. I refresh the data. Um, I've used examples where, well, this is AP analysis, and this is the concept of a pivot table. So if we think about data warehousing and cubes, and these are leveraging SQL Server analysis services. Very powerful, very robust and extensible. 
And as you think about the concept of a cube and what do you get to do pivot tables in your world today, um, dimensions and measures. And you know, we've got lots of dimensions and we've got lots of measures such as accounts, could be segments, um, could be types of accounts, could be checkbooks, could be companies. So if I had 15 legal entities, they're all in the data warehouse together. I had the ability to look across multiple entities or one, but very quickly. If I had five receivable subledgers, I could see my AR right away, but yet they're all separate and so forth. So again, dimensions, measures, I played around with this. Um, I turned around and did one over here on a sales cube where, you know, what have I got? I got salesperson and items. It's like, okay, who's selling, which of my reps are selling what items? Can I trend that over three years? I could graph it, I could chart it. Um, and as we play around with this, you might say, well, how hard is this to work with? Let's just copy this guy. And let's come down here and let's just paste it in this sheet. And so what I was looking at is, well, I was looking at items. So let's get rid of items. And so real quick, now I'm just looking at rep sales. And if I drive down and let's get a different dimension, um, again, companies, I've got customer dimensions. Maybe I want to see what reps are selling to what customers. So let's go grab a customer dimension. And so now I'm looking at rep sales by customer. I can slice that and dice that. I can, you know, my world, I've got a pivot table, 20 tabs. I hit the refresh button and it all dials up. It's a great experience, okay? Part of the collection. Um, what else did we talk about? Talk about Power BI, Power BI, Power BI. So I opened up my office. And again, if you're not an Office 365 customer, here's what you end up with here. I've got a ton of apps. I launched my Power BI basically, and I'm in here picking, you know, different workspaces that are already connected to GP. And again, whether they're ERP workspaces, whether they're Microsoft CRM, this is a composite view. I don't care where the data's at. You don't care where the data's at because as an end user, you're not worried about the technical details. You're worried about the experience and how do I process the work that I need to be done. Hey, you want to refresh this? Yeah, go ahead and refresh it. But that concept of refreshing data is very important. And it's very time saving. So again, touching on key experiences, Smartless Builder, Business Analyzer, SQL Server Reports, Power BI. Um, there are lots of different tools that people use to, to you know, rendering data and so forth. How are we doing? I think we're doing good. All right. So plan here, uh, code to cash. I'm just going to walk through a couple transaction scenarios. And, and in my world, um, sales transaction entry. And I realized that not everybody's a distributor. And I said, okay, let's do a quote. So I've got the ability to start with a quote, convert it to an order, pick, pack, ship, fulfill it. So let's do a quote. I can type here. And we're going to go grab quote number autos. Let's get Aaron Fit. This is auto complete. So they got a lot of neat stuff built in there. And let's do the shootout batch. And I can put a PO number in there and I say, I'm going to give him a quote for one gig processor and I'm going to get him 10 of those. And, you know, this is, this is a thin view. There's a more detailed view and you can see I've got reps and details and where am I shipping it from and what's the price level and, you know, can I do a price trace and I can drill down into some of this and see, wow, look at all this stuff going on. And, you know, I've got a lot of capabilities to do complex pricing or simple pricing. Um, I could actually even get quotes, price traces, um, but a simple example of a quote can turn around and generate the quote. And, you know, as we think about printing experiences here, we leverage Microsoft Word is, a, uh, is the engine behind a lot of the documents, which means you want to change them, you go into Word, change the template, save it, and that's it. And so concepts of template, these are all Word-based templates. So again, leveraging Word. Um, it also allows us to turn around and email out a PDF document to a customer. So again, as we step through this slowly, there's our quote, okay? So if I didn't like the format, I could go in there, I could add, hey, thank you for your business, put some graphics, images. There are tools in there to upload logos, so they've made it very easy to use Word Forms. And again, they've given you a very familiar place to customize the document. You don't have to get that comp sci guy in there. So, so there's the quote. So let's go grab that quote, and guess what? And I've got ways to, to manage those, and where are those quotes, and is it expired? And so smart lists, we use smart lists to lift those exceptions. Give me the quotes expiring today. In dynamic CRM? This stuff by flows. You know, whether the quotes live in CRM and show up in the ERP, you know, if I'm doing demand planning, I can have probabilities and use quotes as part of my demand planning. So the question is, is it soft book, is it firm book? So depending on process, maybe I need to incorporate quotes that have a high probability in my forecast if I'm looking at production. Um, so how easy is this? We've got a quote, we're gonna transfer it. I'm gonna turn it into an order because I have to process it and I'm gonna transfer this guy. Oh, credit limit. That's an important thing to check. Remember, I uh, just gave him a new limit. Say OK here. And so, just like that. And I get a log. tells me what's been transferred. And there we are. Now we have an order. OK. So that's great. And, you know, even if you look at this system and navigation. Oh, there's a note out here for the customer. Uh oh, there's an attachment. Let's go see what that is. What is this? 
and it's a picture of me skiing up on a mountain there. So we can attach just about anything to that customer. But if we're thinking about notes and trying to prompt our workers, we can pop these. We can have stuff jumping up and down and reminding users, you need to do this for this guy and don't forget this. And you know, here's map point as we drill through. We've got, uh, if we drill back to the customer for a second, we talk about this profile. I've got a parent child location configuration here. Okay, so I can have an unlimited number of customers that are childs to parents and unlimited number of ship twos to customers. And on every one of these records, the internet profile is in play. So across the system, we everything internet, mail, mail, mail. And then even as we get down here to the location level, if hey, if you're gonna let me suck your cash out of the bank account, I can go in here and configure your EFT. And when your money's due, it's in my bank account. Most people like to push money. They don't like it when I pull it out of your account. That's kind of funny, isn't it, how that works? But the feature is there, we're able to do that. Um, what else do we do in here? We define the internet profiles. What does he want to get? Does he want to get email? Does he want to get what kind of format? Hey, he wants a doc, an HTML, a PDF. Um, the, pro, the personalization goes deep. Even here, even to the point where custom email message IDs. As a customer, when I print a batch of 1,000 invoices, 999 of them are the standard, but you get a special invoice, you get a special message on your email, and I can get to that degree of personalization. Okay, not everybody does that, but just understand that it's, it's that flexible um, to personalize. Okay, so we did an order. What happens next? We print a picking ticket. Maybe not. Maybe I'm out in the warehouse and, hey, I got a new order. I got to go pick, pack, and ship it. I finish it up. And typically what happens is it, is it drives that separate fulfillment. And again, as we go look at even document types, a document isn't just a document. I can have, wow, 10 kinds of orders, special order, EDI order, a web order. What's a special order? Maybe it's a drop ship. What's an RMA order? We shipped them wrong, it's a, it's a fixed order. So again, why do I do that is because these different order types can have different processes, different workflows. So again, here I am on that configuration where do I use a separate fulfillment or not? Do I let people delete things? Do they have to be fulfilled before I invoice? We're creating rules, we're creating holds, gates. Again, I can have a very thin process, I can have a very elongated process. And as I add more and more complex warehouse management, I can silo this stuff, I can have fulfillment. So, we go deep on that, and again, the last part of this, let's just go ahead and transfer it to an invoice now, and we're finished with our invoice, and again, I'm doing these individually, these can be done in bulk, they can be done as individuals, different people have different processes, now we have an invoice, we turn around, and we can print and email the invoice. So that's a, a pretty straightforward quote to cash process, as I'm kind of demoing that, and let me just back up to the invoice again and show you a little more detail here. So one thing that I can do is just take a dive back, is we think about the items in the system. And, you know, okay, I'm not doing inventory, but an inventory, it can be inventory, it can be service. We use items for lots of things. We use them on POs for paper products. We use them for professional services buildings. We use them for line items on manufacturing components. I could have items that are red, green, and blue. Well, when you buy this thing, you can pick a color, drive it through a configurator, you pick red. What's red on the bill of material? It's not inventory. So a lot of things that surround this, but even more so if you think about related information, how do I price it? How do I stock it? How do I replenish it? Who do I buy it from? Okay, full ERP, full supply chain, okay? Um, and even as we get into re resource planning, do I buy it, do I make it? So I've got full manufacturing in here. And again, if I'm planning it, how do I plan it? How many do I make? Do I make a batch? Do I round up? Do I round down? Do I use a vendor's economic order quantity? It's all those things that you'd expect to see in a full supply chain distribution model, okay? So that was the quote to cash. Let's take the other side. Let's go look at purchasing. So in our purchasing stack, what do I want to do? I can start with a requisition, okay? Great process, built in, web client. Hey, I need a new laptop, submit, workflow, approval, turns into a PO. Um, I also can come down here and say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do a, a PO generator and see without any filters, what do I need to buy? And based on settings, it's going to come down here and say, oh, well, you've got this product here, and this is the one that I was playing with. I said, well, you need to buy some of these, and you've got 19 available, and, you know, but there's some missing pieces, and, you know, who's the vendor, and so forth, and, you know, I can fill these things in and say, okay, great, now I'm actually able to say, all right, let's do that, and let's generate a PO, and this is a very simple version, PO generator, mins and maxes, but some people, that's all they need to manage inventory, but I actually also have a much more robust MRP module in the system. Um, that allows us to take into consideration supply, demand, forecast, lead times, sub, sub, sub component demand and aggregate and roll up. So I can get, go from simple to very complex. But let's see what that did. So let's go to POs. 
And let's go to the end here and let's see if they found it. And there's my one gig processor and it actually had me order 50 cases for that product. So it created the PO for me. It's new. It's not on order. It's not released. How much process do I need? Submit, workflow. I had somebody the other day, I can't print the PO. It's not approved. That makes sense. You can't print it. You can't email it until somebody approves it. So absolutely can do separation of duties. Okay. Or we've got one person that can fly through the process and they can come in here and print and email the PO and they're off to the races and then they can turn around and receive it. And let's just use an example of this. Let's see what we get here. And this is a standard report. This isn't the word form. I have the word form also, but again, you're going to see that all of these reports are modifiable as well. So, okay, so if we go back, grab our PO, it is now released. So what does that mean? Well, if I go do an inquiry into inventory, and again, I can use menus to navigate, which they've been here forever. Let's go to this wonderful available to promise and let's bring up our one gig proc. And let's see what we get here. Let's grab our warehouse. And so look at that. There's the PO I just created. And I get a pretty good view of the world in terms of what's on hand, what's allocated, available, free forward. If I've got pending receipts, that means they're in a batch. They haven't been posted. Maybe I've got demand from manufacturing components. Again, drill through. I can go back and drill back to this PO. Just that easy. I'm able to drive around. So there's the PO. And let's just chase it through the process. And knowing that from a menu standpoint, I've got separation where the doc guy gets a receiving window. And he can be in here pounding in transactions like this and assigning them to a batch. And let's just put them in a shootout batch again. And again, depending on what the guy's role is, maybe he can't do this. And let's bring up advanced. And, you know, he's in there and there's actually an auto receive where I can see every PO that's out there. And, oh, there's the one I wanted. And, you know, can I short receive it? Absolutely. I don't have to. And even moreover, I can define tolerances on PO receipts. Is there an over? Is there an under? And so forth. So I'm going to receive this transaction. Um, one other thing that lives in here is it receives catch up. Did I hit it? Thought I did. Draw that again. Live demos. Anything can happen. Um, the other thing baked in here is landed cost. If you think about importing, I've got duties, I've got freight, I've got taxes. I've got the ability to do landed cost estimates and different line items so that it'll estimate expenses, capitalizes those. I actually get a three-way match against my landed cost invoices and it'll actually do cost corrections if necessary. Um, distributions, user-defined, typically what we see is it's hitting the expenser balance sheet inventory and accrued purchases. But there's an example. Um, okay, so I'm going to post this guy. Actually, I assigned it to a batch. Let's take the batch off. And this is, again, permissions. We can keep people from doing these things. But we're just jamming this through. Posting journals. Great comment. Ah, cancel, cancel, cancel. Oh, I hate when that happens. What do I do about my posting journals? Well, thankfully, GP's data model is so complete that I can reprint posting journals at any point in time. I lose nothing. When you void a transaction, it's like I tell people, it's like muddy footprints on the carpet. Original, it's voided. Back out and correct. Original, reversing, correcting. Nothing goes away. We keep 100% of the audit trail. To that point, I can reproduce any posting journals, any of those documents at any point in time. A lot of people use the system, and when they post, nothing prints. That way, we're not shuffling paper. And everybody says, well, I can print them all at the end of the month. Well, if you can print them at any time, why would you even print them? So there's a lot of interesting arguments, but the system, again, so complete that I can regenerate all those posting documents. So we did a PO. We generated a PO. We received the PO. Um, intermatch. This is that three-way match process. And I will go over to accounts payable and do that. So this is the voucher, or excuse me, vendor invoice. Okay, let's go grab advanced again. And I could have assigned that to a batch. And same thing, I have an auto invoice where now it's going to show me all the received POs. So he may invoice me for multiple invoices on one PO. Let's grab this guy again here, and let's invoice that. Now, this is the place that if I take, you know what, he billed me. He billed me $14 or $15.50. Uh-oh, what happened? Uh, yeah, I got a cost correction on this. And so now we're actually able to generate a variance, okay? Um, and this system does support both uh, actual costing and standard costing, which means just that. So for manufacturers, whether I'm doing a standard costing, where I've got standard material costs, and I'm looking at variances and cost corrections, we can get to that level of complexity as well. Um, so that's it. This is a voucher. I post this transaction. It's over in the accounts payable subledger, ready for me to pick it up and pay that bill. Same thing. Lots of posting journals. Cancel, 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 and cancel. Everybody drives everybody crazy. So, so that's a PO process. Okay. Very elegant. Again, MRP PO generator. Let's generate POs based on demand, reorder points. Let's release those POs, email them, print them, 
with seeding can be, again, via a mobile device in the warehouse. I could have a zebra printer. I could be barcoding as I go. Three-way mash, accounting's happy, and so forth. So let's say we're non-distributor. Accounts payable, okay? So as we think about just standard accounts payable, I'm just vouchering. I've got all the document types. This is a reference that goes to GL. TV. So that's a trial balance reference. That's kind of nice to be able to punch that in. Batches again. Am I going to use that shootout batch again? And as we think about batches, comment, workflow, approvals. We can do a little, we can go extend it. Some people turn on simple approvals where it's just a password. Other people, I got an email notification that there's a batch of checks. I'm going to go in and look. I've got unapproved. I approve. You get a notification. Your batch is approved. You come back and finish your process. So again, we can have simple. We can have more involved. Um, the other thing about these batches and also general ledger is I've got different frequencies. I can have single use, I can have recurring batches and so forth. So let's finish the transaction and we're vouchering and again, auto complete. So again, lookups, who did I use last? Let's go get a different vendor. Let's get a case travel. I can auto document number or not. It does duplicate document detection, whether it's posted or unposted. Okay. And this is just a voucher. System does 1099s. This is guy set up as a 1099 vendor, it can say, well, that's not a 1099 invoice. It's that simple. Um, I could actually generate a check right here. Okay, so, or I can record a check that's already been written as a non-AP. In this case, I'll say, okay, let's just go ahead and do that, and let's come in here and print a computer check. And again, I have to have security to be doing all this stuff, but, uh, and I have the option to throw in a Micker product where to lay down all the ink on the paper, so it really depends on how much of that we want to do, but this is an example where I just dropped a check in, cut a check, that's simple. It knows it's a check. My distributions have been changed. I'm hitting expense and I'm hitting cash. That's what we'd expect. Okay, so that's one example of a voucher. Let's just do another one here. Remembers who I was working on. Put another invoice in. Could be this simple. And as we get down here into distributions, like, well, how does it know? Vendor setup, we set defaults at the vendor level. You know, and maybe in this case, like, well, you know, I'm only gonna split this one. And we're gonna come down here and add another distribution. Oops. Let's put it into 365.20. Yeah, put $5,000 in here. And if we were running multiple entities, this does support intercompany, okay? Which means I could be debiting and crediting between a couple of legal entities. And again, it'll do the do two do froms. I cut one check to one vendor instead of breaking the invoice and putting it into three different companies. There is also the ability to capture additional dimension information um, around this as well. And when we talk about dimensional accounting, you know, I've got a department, I've got a main account, I've got a, a you know, a division maybe, but maybe I need to capture an additional dimension. Great example is I hit vehicle expense. What car is it? What truck is it? Okay, it's not, in, it's not in my GL segmentation, but I need the analytics on the vehicle expenses. I need to know how much I'm spending by each truck, but I don't want to blow up my chart of accounts. I had a company that had a you know, 100 aircraft. Well, they actually had a segment for aircraft, and so their chart went, whoosh. the better way to do it is let's peel the aircraft out of there and use it as a dimension. So this supports dimensional accounting as well. Okay, standard voucher. Again, I'm done. I come back in here. What's my processes? Let's go down to my batches. Again, if the batch is approved, where's my shootout batch? You can see I've got lots of stuff in here. There's my shootout batch. I can turn around, I can print an edit list. I can post this guy. Let's just go ahead and post this. And I'm gonna do, I'll give you a look at a register. If I haven't showed you any. Lots of stuff can print. I can turn all those off. Again, a lot of configuration on posting. Do I post all the way through the GL? Do I post and stop? So again, we're, we're changing those behaviors as we go. And lots of reports it wants to print. And here's what a posting journal looks like. And so in this, I'll just make it real big. And this is basically, it's a restatement of the vouchers. If there was a disbursement, there's that, there's that cash one I did. My distributions. Here's the next invoice. Okay. And a recap at the bottom of what the total batch is. And that batch is posted. Okay. So how do I see that? You know, there's lots of different ways to drill through the information. You know, I could say, well, let's go pull up an inquiry. And again, work, unposted, posted, not paid, posted and paid. You know, if I wanted to go see just what he has, okay, I can grab a transaction, I can drill down. I can drill back to the subledger, okay? Again, we're starting in those subledgers. So, so good inquiries, I've got the ability to find those things. So let's talk about the other part of procure to pay. Let's talk about paying. Real nice menus, I've got a great selection menu. And let's do another shootout batch. So what kind of batch is this? This one, oh, checks, EFTs, and credit cards. So it knows about that. I could pay an entire batch with a credit card, book the transaction on the, on the originating vendor. I paid it with American Express. 
flips it over to the Amex account, I get the statement, everything's there. My vendor has the history of the purchases, not the credit card vendor. Um, but let's just do a check run. Let's pick a bank account. You know, and as I just dive back on checkbooks, what we find in here is we're setting these things up. It's built in, knows how to communicate. You know, if I drill down, payables, okay. Configurators, this concept of being able to build a configuration of I've got an outbound EFT, I've got an inbound EFT, I've got a safe payout, I've got a bank reconciliation in, I've got a lockbox in. So I've got a lot of bi-directional feeds with banking um, to the point where configurator, it knows about standard templates. It's like, okay, well, how do you communicate with this bank? Is it an FTP link? So I can fire these things out with a secure SFTP right out of my system. So again, just kind of a segue there as we're talking about check production, but we added that, we created the batch. So what do we do next? How do I decide what to pay? Favorite one, best one actually, is due date cutoff. Hey, you know, next time I'm doing checks is down here, get everybody due before that. You know, I can select one vendor and say, you know what, take non-qualifying discounts up on this guy. And then I can go get the rest of the people. So we have a lot of that exception management built in as well. So let's build the batch. So again, it's a build the batch, and you notice the change to add to the batch, add to the batch, so I can grab this guy, this guy, get everybody else. I've got pay priorities, I've got lots of filters. I got $20,000 to pay here. So even again, look and feel, edit check batch. I can see very quickly who's getting paid, what vouchers I'm paying. You know, maybe I don't want to pay all this. Maybe I want to go in and edit this, and I want to go into the apply and say, okay, well, you know, for that invoice, you know, maybe I want to come in here and take a big write-off anyway, or take a terms discount. So I've got that flexibility to add, edit to the batch. And again, that's kind of the mode that I'm in as I'm editing that check batch. Um, am I ready to print checks? Do I print a check register? I give it to my boss. I might have to submit this batch for approval. I can't print. I get the batch ready, submit it, somebody looks at it, he approves it, tweaks it, tunes it, and then we eventually get to that point where we can come in here and print checks. Okay, so um, from a top-down selection, I certainly can post manual payments, wires very easily, um, but again, we select, we edit, we print, we post EFTs. I'm sending out remittance advice. What happens next? Hey, I'm generating my EFTs to the bank. Again, very top-down process. Okay, um, certainly there's aging reports, Everything date sensitive, as of, as of AP, as of AR, as of inventory stock status, as of everything. So I can use, if I'm reconciling to a point in time, I believe they've added the as of uninvoiced proceedings. That's where, what have I received but not been invoiced for? That's another balance sheet. So if you think about reconciling subledgers back to the GL, again, we've got all that covered. Okay, so that's your quote to cash. Um, and I'm touching on the major pillar, so projects and, and project subledgers. And so let's just talk about GP. And again, I'm going to show you we've got a contract, I've got a project, and as I get, and this is the hierarchy is really what I'm showing here, and I get down to a cost code. So I ran my business on this for 15 years. I'm a professional services org. Again, basically, what are we doing? We're defining cost categories. Is it material? Is it labor? Is it expense? And so as we go and we drive in and we're trying to premise our budget, and if I drill down deeper, and, you know, maybe I want to see the, uh, you know, what's the allocation of this over time. And certainly, I can get pretty sophisticated this project ledger. I have big companies using this. Project accounting. It is nails on project accounting. It'll do fixed. It'll do TMM. It'll do revenue recognition. So, again, there's a lot that this thing can do. Um, my biggest complaint was project management. You know, I couldn't get a Gantt. I couldn't tie down people to activities. And so, again, from a project accounting, the accounting is rock star. There's no questions about what we can do there in terms of different methods and markup methods and so forth. But again, we're, it, it, we're shortcoming for me, and I switched off of this about three years ago to the product that Tony's going to show you um, because of that. So um, again, very strong project ledger. Uh, when people stand up GP, time and expense, if it's included, let's get everybody doing their time sheets and expense reports. Maybe we just use it for expense reports. There's a nice app. What do we do? I'm not, not a project shop, but I would set up projects for departments. and. Airfare, hotel, meals, vehicle, and employees can book expenses against the project, and it knows how to drive the accounting down to the P&L. And it's a nice, elegant process. I put my expense report in. I can attach a picture. I hit submit. Workflow approval goes into payables. You get your check. And it works very, very well. And again, shortcomings, just as you've heard. Um, what else? Navigation pane. A lot of stuff in here. I have got a ton of stuff in my install. I do my own demos. And why is that? So manufacturing. And so I led the manufacturing charge for many years until I hired a bunch of people. And now I've got four other people behind me. But 
you know, as I get into modeling, you know, how do I use GP manufacturing? And, you know, believe me, I've got some, some very complex uh, client installations. And this, this illustrates that, and I can go eight, nine level deep on sub-assemblies. I can do phantoms. Uh, does a great job on discrete. We've got process manufacturers using this as well. Um, there are deeper functionality sets for manufacturing that can be added, but as you look at this illustration where, you know, I've got an item where I define this item, and as I jump around a little bit here, you know, on this particular item, we came and said, oh, okay, this is, we went down to planning data, we said, all right, let's go pull up our warehouse. We are multi-site. Oh, uh, well, it says it's a buy item. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously got a bill of material. I go to the engineering data on this one. Ah, it says it's a make item. So even as you look at the configuration, I say I make the item. Well, how do I make the item? Do I make the stock? Do I make the order? Again, I can take a sales order. Pops up a window. I'm making that per customer order. I actually have a configurator, which means that's, hey, now that you picked this, you need to make some choices. Red, green, or blue. Red. Well, now that you picked red, you get a choice of A, B, or C. I can drive a configurator experience, that's a standard module in here, but what that does is keeps us from having too many permutations of bill of materials, okay? So again, a lot of configuration that kind of drives this behavior. Um, from a costing standpoint, I'd mentioned that I can have standard costing, okay? And I mean, again, they got nine cost buckets, material, fixed and variable, overhead, labor, fixed and variable, and machine, fixed and variable. So nine different cost layers that I can manage on a standard costing basis. Um, the other thing that I drive down below this is routings. And I can go simple or I can go complex, I could have Umpteen routings. I've got people that manufacture circuit boards. I've got people doing medical devices. I've got people making salamis. Uh, you know, I mean, we've got a variety. Coffee, you know, in town, Renoco, Volpe, on that side. Again, the medical device manufacturers. I've got a group that, uh, that extrudes raw glass into these little bitty things that go into IV bombs. They've got a nine-level bill of material. Again, there's quality. I mean, it's, it's pretty complex. And so, again, a lot of scalability here. Um, but even if you're driving, you know, simple, we can do standard labor. We can do standard machine. And what we're trying to do is reallocate these wages into cost of goods. And it changes the accounting equation where we're looking at, well, how much does it really cost me to make it? And a lot of people cost with materials only. So again, I talk about manufacturing um, all the way out to the shop floor. I could swipe in, I clocked into an operation, I clock out, how many pieces did you make, how much scrap, and again, all the transactions flow. And again, accounting, we've got a very robust accounting behind this thing. Um, Back to, back to that point, as we go back to uh, complexity, I jumped to that item window. Oh, let's go back here for a second. I go back to the item a second, you're like, ooh, posting accounts. So one of the things that, you know, as we think about challenges companies have that, that are coming off of QuickBooks, it's accounting. Okay, if you look at all these GL accounts that I have for manufacturing, don't be daunted, but this is back to those nine cost buckets. How am I tracking variance, you know, in those nine categories? Am I tracking WIP? Am I tracking COGS? Am I tracking how much labor is in my balance sheet, part of that balance sheet inventory. So, and, and don't get me wrong, you don't have to key these in. There are groups, there are classes of customers, classes of items that roll down these defaults. But to that point, I get very sophisticated, or not. I could have one GL account in there for variance, one for WIP, one for material, and we don't have to get, but if you want to, scalability is what we're talking about here, okay? Brad, how many more minutes do I have, like seven? Uh, <laughs> That's fine. So I've hit a few key pillars, the, and you're always like, you didn't say anything about General Ledger. I will talk about General Ledger in a second here. Let me see if I've got one more. Come on. My computer's been very good today, guys, by the way. Human capital management. So, you know, one of the things that Microsoft did um, a few years ago, and I tell people it was because of ACA compliance. They baked in payroll and human resources. They gave an unlimited license to everybody. And if we think about what that means is, you know, um, you know, certainly I can run payroll in this. I said there's a lot of people doing payroll, but the extensibility of the human resource data as well as the payroll data, it's pretty comprehensive, okay? So this application's in there. People that switch to this, they may have ADP or Paycom or Paylocity or something, but at the end of the day, they're doing ROI calculations of bringing payroll in-house. And as we think about, are you manufacturing? Are you doing professional services? You're going to have your people in here anyway because they're time keepers because they may be resources, okay? But um, as we think about how far do we go um, all the way from applicant tracking and you know can I track and set up the people that I'm doing an interview with and can I color code them and you know and can I collaborate with them with my peers on collecting information in documents back to the repository let's get out of the Excel spreadsheets let's get the data in here even if you're not running a full payroll 
this is available. It, it, it installs right out of the box, and there's a lot there. Now, we know the extensibility. I mentioned self-service apps. We've got a, a, a myriad of self-service apps for workers to do a timesheet, to do a W-4, to print a paycheck, to, to enroll in benefits, to opt in, opt out, and everything they do goes through workflow and gets approved before it gets committed. And we've got logging, we've got auditability on that stuff as well. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on human capital management, but I have to mention it. Um, so general ledger. I didn't spend much time. Let's go back to our chart of accounts for a second. <laughs> Configurable. Okay, they give us a framework to work in. We can bust this up. We can grow it. We can shrink it. A set of tools come with GP to change your chart, to change your customers, to combine customers, combined items, rename items. They've given you everything you need so that six months from now you're not going, oh, I wish I would have done that. We can change it. It rolls through the entire system. So, but one of the little proofs here is we talked about doc attached. We talked about required fields. I don't know why I made drill down. Somebody did that to me. Um, but again, my ability, and I'm not showing the financial statement reporting tool here, kind of showed you what it looks like, but the drill down, drill down, drill down, drill down. So chart's pretty standard, um, and I think the one thing that I like to show people is everybody's like, well, what's the journal entry look like? And so I mentioned that everything can flow through the ledger. Well, here's an ADP batch, okay? Well, what kind of batches do I have out here? Here's a GJ, that was a demo, these are mine. Inventory adjustments, that came from the subledger. So if I go look at all the different batches that are out here, I have a ton of stuff. And one of the interesting things in GP does is they prefix everything. So you look at it, you know, oh, that's a PO invoice, that's a receiving, um, this one is a, a cash receipt, that's a sale, that's a sales transaction, and so forth. Okay, so everything has got an audit ID on it. Um, let's manually do a GJ. Let's create a shootout batch again. And again, I got recurring frequencies on these. They could be a, a monthly batch for my standard entries. Um, Again, date sensitive. I can do standard reversing. It books both entries out right now. Um, being date sensitive, I have the ability in here to post back to one prior closed fiscal year. So I can close the year on January 2nd, no sweat, rolls the balances forward, can generate a balance sheet at you know, 131. March, I got my adjusting entries. I tell it, hey, I'm going to post to 1231. I have to have permission, have to open up the period, but I can post back to 1231 in detail, and it'll update my beginning balance and retained earnings. So again, date sensitive, very important deal. Um, Let's just make this a standard entry, and here's all these audit prefixes. I added ADP. Why? Because, you know, if I'm bringing data in from ADP, I'm not going to call it a GJ. Because if I want to go see what, what came from ADP, call it ADP. So, again, even that extensibility, it's new. And, again, that's just on that systems integration concept. So let's just say it is an ADP batch, and this is my reference, and I can key this in. And this is a journal entry. And let's do this one. Zero, zero, zero. And there's a thousand dollar GJ. Okay, and I just saved it, and it's part of my batch. Um, the other nice thing that they've added, and I just had a little one, is I just I can take a journal entry from an Excel sheet, and of course, Microsoft better have done this, and they finally did. And I can paste right from a GJ into here, and I still have to come back in and put my note. Okay, and so that is a, a copy and paste. So why is that nice? I get that file from ADP, copy, paste it, I'm done. Do I need an integration tool? I could. Multiple GJs, systems integration from other line of business. We've got integration tools, but certainly the ease of use is very important. Um, talk about copy correct. Again, we don't lose any, any of that audit trail data. And what was left? So we talked about financials. We talked about lots of stuff. Oh, okay. Custom pieces. What do custom pieces look like? You know, these integrations and these ISVs. Let's do a... Uh, Let's do an invoice here. Let's just do this. my last piece for you guys, and then I'll shut up, and you can ask me a couple questions while we change. And you guys can ask questions after today, too, so let's just keep that in mind. So, so custom stuff. How do ISVs look in here? And I have so much stuff baked in. So let's, let's do a credit check. So I'm the guy that when we talk, I got core. What do I need to show you? And if you look at these additional, holy cow. Is that list? Oh, there it is. That's a lot of stuff. That's not all standard GP stuff, but that's how stuff plugs in. It's trans You don't even know. You don't know where it stops and starts. We're honest. We're transparent. Hey, these are plugins. Okay. Where does it stop where it starts? That's not really the concern. But again, if you think about extensibility, great example. So things that I've plugged in here, collections management. Oh, I'm on the phone doing order. Wow. Collections. Hey, you know what? While I've got you and you're placing the order, you owe me some money. And there's a note out here, and I can collaborate, and I can look at unposted sales, unposted orders, unposted cash, total outstanding, available credit. I get a 360 view of the guy right now. That's collections. 
Now, outside of sales order entry, if I'm using collections, I'm making calls, I'm doing notes, I've got the ability to go in here and do queries. Show me everybody that's over 90 that owes me more than 10 grand. You're calling up. Show me everybody that's over 90 that's less than 10. That's the list for somebody else. We can segment it. You're a collector, you're a collector. We're all working in our little queues. I can generate the aging report with the notes. It's all baked in. And again, a little bit of, little bit of you see, a little bit different. And again, great partner. These are people that are certified industry partners with Microsoft. But this is an example of collections and how nicely it fits in. What else is in here? I've got commissions in here. And this is pretty slick stuff, too. Because as we think about commissioning and how do we do it, and this is kind of what shows up, and it's calculating a commission for this particular order. And if we look at, well, how did it do it, and what's the deals, and oh, there's an item plan, a salesperson plan, a customer plan, and you know, we can drill around. And, and again, this one, same thing. You can't tell where it stops and where it starts. It looks identical to GP, but this is written by a provider. Now, GP has grown because Microsoft has bought that IP. If you're somebody and you wrote a product and you've got 1,000 customers, I want your stuff. Let me bake it in. You've only got two customers, we'll let you manage it. Okay, but that's how GP has grown over time. They buy, they buy products, they buy IP, and they build it in. Um, so again, really just look how seamless is it. Like I said, I have lots of stuff baked in, and I am actually going to stop there. So I think I covered everything I wanted to show you. Again, is a, is a shootout and a capability. Like I said, there's a lot of information on the memory stick you can drill down. Um, I love GP. I'm still selling this. I'm selling it in the cloud. I'm selling it on-premise. Um, why is it still so popular? And Microsoft's like, oh, they want him to succeed, but we've got 50,000 customers, and you know, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of users. Strong application, consistent, easy to implement, footprint. Okay, it knows workflow out of the box. I'm not in here engineering the solution. You have to look at GP and say, that works for me. I'll use it. You know, that doesn't even fit. Or, wow, there's a, there's a piece that drops in, and guess what? Now it fits perfect, and I'm not customizing it. Most of these projects. 95, 97% right out of the box. That 3%, I'm changing your invoice, I'm changing your PO, I may be building an integration, but they're peripheral type of, you know, ex, ex, you know let's call them extensions, okay? So um, that's the value prop. Um, I got a couple minutes and then we'll switch gears here. Questions? We did have a question from somebody online. Mike asks, can the system allow labor tickets with two sites that share, that share employees slash resources and then in parentheses machine cell, and prorate the employee time when keying time on site one work order and site two work order at the same time. So the, the labor allocation, so we're talking about can we allocate labor if I'm an employee and I'm clocking against, you say two sites, two warehouses? Two sites that share employees and resources. Yeah, I, know that, I know that we can do that type of allocation. I would have to get in a specific example of that, so I, I would welcome that challenge, but absolutely as we look at, you know, payroll comes in and I hit all of his cost goes into wages, and that is in fact the way that we allocate his wages out is by clocking whether it's to a project or to a manufacturing order or to a different site, and what we'd end up with is, an, is a reallocation of wages from a generic into more specific buckets. Um, we have done intercompany with payroll as well, where we have one payroll company that's got a thousand employees and based on how they're clocking their time, it's allocated actually in an intercompany manner into other legal entities, but it certainly could be allocated between departments or locations, a segment of the general ledger. So that is, that is a, a standard premise of the system. Again, whether it's project or whether it's manufacturing, it both works the same way. Um, the system has a, has a concept built in here, and again, the example on supply chain is, you know, a site can actually drive a general ledger segment. So that when I pick an inventory site like the warehouse, it's changing the segmentation on the transaction and varies that. That same thing happens when I'm purchasing or whether I'm doing labor entries. 